Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Pykel with League of Items, and I'm going to uh, give the whole tier list thing another shot. And I'm not necessarily changing where I have teams uh, ranked, but I'm going to talk about the teams in the order that Molecule has prepared this thread. I think that these infographics are awesome uh, with like the amount of information that's on there and you can kind of try to dive, uh, dig into. So I'm going to go through each one of these teams and I'm going to talk about where I have them rated and maybe I'll change them a little bit based on the information that's in this or I, I won't necessarily change what tier I think a team is in, but I might change like their upward or downward mobility. Like if a team that I'm not familiar with plays a lot of the champions that I like and uh, would match up theoretically well against uh, some of these other teams, maybe I could see myself elevating them. One, of, A few of the main things that I use as um, kind of assumptions or baselines for myself is that generally in Worlds, the the good teams, it doesn't really matter what playstyle they have when they're playing against much lesser competition. Uh, like, obviously, if you get completely draft diffed by a by a, a low tier team at Worlds, you can still lose a match. Um, but in general, the talent discrepancy between the very good teams and the very, like, okay teams is just massive. And you might not agree with that. And if you don't agree with that, that's fine. But the purpose of this video and the purpose of most of my videos on my channel is to think about them from a betting perspective and to try to try to get as much information as possible so that when we make a bet uh, or when we play on DraftKings, uh, we have good information that we can work with. And it's not always the correct information. I'm not going to look at things the right way 100% of the time, but you don't need to be 100 you don't need to be right 100% of the time in order to make money the other thing i want to talk about real fast uh, or at least mention because some people have brought it up people say why don't you do more preparation before you get started and the reason why i do that is because i think that it's more interesting for most people that really care about this kind of information to listen to me go through my thought process because if you if you fundamentally disagree with my thought process then maybe that's a maybe that's a way that you can find an advantage because maybe there are a lot of people out there who think like me uh and maybe not uh normally not <laughs> but uh that's that's fine so I'm not 100% sure how much time I'm going to spend on each team, uh, but I want to see what kind of commonalities we can find between these teams and think about how they might line up in the tier list that I made previously and their upward and downward mobility uh, and just some general thoughts like that. So the first team is Red Canids from Brazil. Uh, so we'll just... Let's start with the bands. So the champions that they banned... Um, most of the time on blue side, were Jace, Varus, and Renekton. So Renekton, obviously a champion that sees a ton of play. Jace is probably just something something that they would ban because their top laner, uh, their top laner's champion pool doesn't do well against it. And we see like Gwen, Viego. I'm not a, I don't, I don't think that, um, obviously Jace is like a good matchup into that. Maybe not so much against Gwen. That's kind of strange to me. Uh, I, the Renekton makes sense. I guess the Jace is probably banned a lot of the time when, in like second rotation, they probably want to protect them from uh, getting punished in the top lane. On the red side, they have Gwen, Renekton, and Xin Zhao. So they obviously care a lot about Renekton. I don't know if that's going to transfer over to Worlds, um, but there are probably most teams at Worlds are going to be playing a decent amount of Renekton. Uh, so just looking through the champion pool, Renekton is not one of the main champions that they play, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think that most people kind of understand that Renekton is good at his job, but can fall behind pretty massively. Uh, then the band against, meaning when teams are preparing their bands against this team, these are the ones that they're generally going to use. And this is, this is much more important than the bands, uh, the band buy. Because this means, like, all the coaching staffs that play against Red Canids think about these champions uh, for different reasons. So, Ezreal is a hypermobile AD carry. Titan is 8-1 on it. 41% ban rate. So that's that's pretty substantial. I would expect that to probably carry over into Worlds. Gwen, 
Leeson, Viego, Camille, and Callista. And yes, I know that some of these are cut off, but this is where my camera goes. So, um, so that's interesting. Uh, I this doesn't necessarily mean that like Aegis is a Leeson one trick or Guigo 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 is a Gwen one trick, but teams like to push those players off of those champions. Uh, so Guigo is has three of the top five bans against our team, so I'm assuming Guigo is a pretty good player. I haven't seen this guy play it very much, but I think that's a safe assumption. So, like, relative to other Brazilian top laners, he must have had a really good split. Um, obviously, when you're a team that's winning, that is going to help your, a lot of your stats, but he could also be contributing to the winning difference for his team, which I think is reasonable. Uh, and then... This notable column is, like, really cool uh, that Molecule put out. So 91% blind pick in top lane. So that's another contributing factor to the reason why they would spend a lot of bans on other top laners like Jace, Renekton, uh, and Gwen. Uh, so they do seem to give a lot of attention to top lane, and that'll be interesting to see how they match up with a lot of the other top laners at the World Championship. Um, the problem is that if you are a top lane-centric team, and this is somewhat speculation on my on my behalf, if you are a somewhat top lane focused team, uh, and you're from a lesser region where the rest of your team isn't that, isn't as strong as their counterparts from the other regions, then you're probably going to have a bad time because you're, if the other team knows to just shut down the top laner and then go even bot lane and they should come out ahead, that's probably the mentality a lot of teams are going to have against uh, a squad like Red Cannons. Aegis... So we have Lee Sin, 311 experience differential at 10 minutes. I don't really care about that. Uh, Diana, uh, Diana Xin Zhao, Viego, Rumble. Did Rumble get a buff recently? He may have gotten a buff. I don't think it's going to be enough to really see him at Worlds. Um, but not very good win rates, which is weird. Like, Diana and Zhao are very important champions. The Lee Sin, being 7-0 on Lee Sin is, is pretty pretty wild. Um, but not much I can take away from that. Uh, jungle, there are so many jungle champions that are just in every jungler's pool, so let's we'll, we'll have to see what the difference is between them and a lot of the other junglers that are going to be on these lists. Grevthar, 11 games played for main roster. So it's a new mid laner. I don't, under, I don't know the reason behind their mid lane swap if if people know why they swapped mid laners feel free to put it in the comments because that's good information to, for everybody to have because if they were like oh you know our last guy was brutal just bring in anybody else then that's not like a a great thing uh but if if they're like oh grevthar is the future then maybe he has some upside the cled pick is interesting that's probably like inspired by do and be uh one on one on syndra one on one on tf akali uh, and then an Aurelia game. So that's pretty different. I mean, I don't think that they're going to be able to express... Uh, I don't think that they're going to be able to utilize skill expression in the mid lane against a lot of these mid laners. Um, so, like, that's the kind of thing where that playstyle might work in Brazil, but it's going to be more difficult at Worlds. Not saying that it couldn't happen. It's just it's unlikely to happen based on what we know about League of Legends and the history of Brazil at Worlds. Uh, Titan, 8-1 and one on Ezreal. I'm going to go ahead and say it. No one should give this guy Ezreal. I don't care how good he is at Ezreal. Uh, if if he's 8-1, and one, then he's doing something right. And just push push a player, push an AD carry off of their comfort champion as much as possible, especially when it's against an underdog. It's just a, a good strategy in general. Nine. 9.5 CS per minute. I don't really care about that. A lot of that's dictated by the the game. Uh, and then JoJo, a lot of Nautilus, a lot of Rakan, Leona, and that's a funny stat. Go, go. 10 of 11 playoff picks were engaged supports. So for Brazil, uh, for Red Canids from Brazil, I have them listed in the D tier. So the, the thing with being in the D tier is that I don't know a lot about most of the teams in that tier, and maybe they can compete with one another, but it's going to be pretty difficult to pick Red Canids against anybody 
like two tiers away from them. So just ask yourself this question. Do you think that red cannons, based on what you know about red cannons, could be 100 Thieves, Mad Lions, Rogue, or Hanbo Life? Now, some of you probably will say, yeah, 100 Thieves. I think Brazil has a, ch a shot against 100 Thieves. Um, 100 Thieves is one of the teams that I I like relative... I like them relative to how other people see them. So that's one spot where people might be zagging, or zigging, and I would be zagging. Uh, so that's it for the first one. Let's go to the next team. Unicorns of Love. So Unicorns of Love were fun to watch at the last world's championship boss ahaha sick i i think it's anana sick but like his name is so much better if it's ahaha sick ahaha sick like sick bro sick uh that just seems like a lot more fun no man's argonoft was not there last time i think that's a new player uh and then santas santas was there last time so I don't know why made, they made this switch. So again, if somebody knows why they made the switch, the reasoning behind it, that is a very important thing uh, to learn uh, before you make bets on stuff like this. Uh, so let's just look at the band against. I don't care about the bands by really. So band against Camille, which is targeting boss. Aurelia, which is against no mans, but is probably against boss as well because it's a flexible champion and boss uh, is a pretty good player in general. Uh, Lee Sin which is a, a target ban. And then Viego, Varus, and Rise. So, I th I think that last time at Worlds, the top half of the map from Unicorns did a really good job. They were I think that they just exceeded expectations last time. So that alone, and people are going to hate me for saying this, that alone, their, their ability to outperform expectations last Worlds, means that they're probably overrated according to the public. That doesn't necessarily mean that the sports books are going to like make their lines go insane because there's probably not a high enough volume of money being bet on the unicorns of love uh, in a lot of the Western sports books to justify manipulating the lines in an attempt to influence the bets that people are making. That's just that's just my opinion. I don't know the stats behind that. I don't think that there's a lot of like published esports st statistics about like the money lines how much they move how much is bet um i don't have access to that kind of information from a sports book uh but that's just that would be my that's my gut feeling of that so let's start with boss i do have good memories of boss so that is a player that like comparing them to the last team uh from brazil like guigo against boss i'm just going to assume that boss is better than them until i see otherwise uh you don't have to do that, but that's what I will do. 69% blind pick. Uh, so, blind picking blind picking is a big indication of how the team is, like, willing to play the game. Uh, and their, their confidence in their top laner. So, I don't really mind that. Uh, that, that stat specifically, though... I'd be interested. I'd be interested to see if that's adjusted for uh, blue side, red side, because that number would be that number would change based on side selection, not based on influenced by side selection. Uh, Anana sick. They were negative in gold and XP in summer for jungle. Okay, so that is very bad. I think it's obvious why that's bad uh, in and of itself. But even more important than that is that when uh, Ahaha ah, 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 Sick is going up against better junglers, that differential is going to cause big tempo disadvantages for Unicorns of Love. It's going to be more difficult for them to contest neutral objectives, and it makes it more likely that they are responding to plays instead of being proactive. So that scares me. That would be something I would try to like find a way to utilize that in a betting way. So like 
if if this stat and my read on it is correct, then early dragons, early towers, first blood are probably going to be good bets for the team playing against Unicorns of Love, assuming that they're roughly the same talent level. Uh, so that's something to watch out for. Nothing that special in the in the champion pool. The fact that they play Trundle is good, uh, and that's pretty interesting uh, because I, I do think the meta that we're going into is going to be a late game meta. Some people are talking about the like assassins are going to be very good at worlds, but if you get if you see a bunch of teams playing assassins, that kind of just incentivizes the other teams to play uh, like hyper carries even more because if you have just enough peel and just enough healing just enough resilience in your team composition, then the assassins aren't going to be able to do enough damage consistently in team fights to kill off the important targets. Uh, and then the team with the, the hyper carries is just going to overwhelm the other team. Uh, so I'm not really uh, as afraid. And then Rek'Sai, three games of Rek'Sai, that's pretty cool as well. Um, may maybe the other reason why they have bad experience in gold differential numbers is because they're very gank heavy. So maybe it's just more volatility. I'd have to do more research on that to to know so if if you are someone who knows unicorns of love very well and you share that with me in the comments that would be pretty helpful like if you know that they're hyper aggressive in the early game they create a lot of snowballs for their solo laners at the expense of their jungler like that is good information to have uh no man's i, I think no man's played pretty well as pretty well at last year's worlds too uh, so the fact that they play Diana Yasuo is good because that's a good combination that you can draft pretty consistently uh, as long as the other teams don't think it's like their bread and butter. Um, Aurelia is a is a strong champion, is pretty matchup dependent, but I don't think teams will band it against them as much. So we'll see if that actually creates an advantage for Unicorns of Love. Like, all it's going to take is one game of No Man's playing well on Aurelia at Worlds to, to kind of bring back the justification for banning it against them. But there are a lot of strong mid like hyper carry esque champions that No Man's plays. So Rise and Cassadin, those are both very good champions uh, for late game scaling. The Cassadin is a little bit scary, but I think that like No Man's playing Cassadin against a, a a lesser team, like if there are lesser teams. Um, if there are teams that they like significantly out, uh, like out talent, um, then that could be a nice, like red side last pick, to pull out every once in a while. So that's something to watch out for. Argonaut, I'm assuming his name is Argonaut. Uh, everybody plays Varus, no big deal. Uh, Tristana, Ash, bad win rates there. Zero games played in summer in playoffs. So again, I don't know what is the deal with this guy. I don't know how it's going to impact their team. They do play some Ziggs. I'm not a huge Ziggs bot fan, so we'll see how that goes at Worlds. Uh, and then Santos, 1.52 wards per minute. That's nice, but that's not game-changing. So a lot of engage supports as well. Galio, Nautilus, Rakan, Alice, or Tom Kench. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm, a, I'm going to assume that's not Tom Kench since the rework, but who knows. Uh, so Unicorns of Love, they are another team that is in the D tier. I think that most people... Uh, would want to say that Unicorns of Love has upward mobility and can beat a lot of the teams in the tiers above them. Like, when you get Unicorns of Love against Team Liquid, C9, Fnatic, PSG, 100 Thieves, Mad Lions, Rogue, Hanma Life, I think a lot of people will want to use Unicorns of Love. Whether or not that's a good idea, that's, that's a different story. I think it's probably not a good idea, because I, I don't really expect them to play as well as they did last year. But we'll see what the uh, the money lines look like and what the ownership's per, ownership uh, roster ship percentages look like on DraftKings. Beyond Gaming. So Beyond Gaming is another team um, from the PCS. Uh, they are PSG's counterpart. So Dago was at Worlds last year, I think. I'm pretty sure he played played well. Uh, Liang, I don't know anything about him. Husha, I don't know about that. Mawan, nope. Dago was there last year. Kino, I'm not sure. Bans against, 55% Thresh, Xin Zhao, Ziggs, Aphelios, Jace, and Ryze. I'm not afraid of the Ziggs. I think you can probably drop the Ziggs ban. Like, it's annoying to play against for some teams, but, I, like, I don't, I don't expect it to be a very important pick at Worlds. Um... 
so getting rid of Thresh that consistently is due to Doggo's Aphelios play. Nine wins, zero losses. That's pretty good. Um, so let's just go top to bottom. Camille, Gwen, Jace, Kennen, Tom Kench. Minus 328 goal differential at 10 minutes. Last in playoffs for top. That makes me feel like they have to absorb a lot of pressure and teams attack Liang. Um, again, this is just... I am I only have the information that I have in front of me. That could be an incorrect take, but I, that's I'm not going to do much more research outside of that. Uh, Husha, 7-3 on Zinjiao. That's good. Viego, 6-3. Viego is going to be a very important champion at Worlds because the teams that can play it will always have that, like, insane play upside, the insane playmaking upside, which is super important, especially if, if you're a team uh, that's, like, not expected to do well. If you can have one player just go playing completely out of their mind on a mechanically intense champion, um, then that, that gives you a chance to pull off some pretty interesting upsets. Uh, because ultimately, like, if you are drafting really strong champions, like... You can outplay the other team for for a game. Is it going to happen in a in a full series? Less likely, but you get that one game. That could be nice. Uh, Seventy three percent kill participation. So just that alone makes me think that Husha is like the most important player for Beyond Gaming outside of Doggo. It's it's like it's funny because Husha might be a carry jungler that their job is to get is to control the early game to let Doggo get to the point where they can carry team fights like. Uh, so you're not introducing volatility into Doggo's like realm, into Doggo's realm in the bot lane, but it buys them time basically. So that's something to watch out for. Malwan, rise. A lot of rise, a lot of Silas, a lot of Oriana. So this is that something that can happen here is that Malwan could potentially get. Uh, picked on by other teams if you ban away a couple of these champions and force them onto something like oriana then you do open up the possibility of the other team playing an assassin into oriana it's a high it's a high volatility thing to do but a lot of these teams that think they're better than beyond gaming would not have any issue making a, a draft decision like that doggo doggo played well last year at worlds so there's nothing really to say about him he is someone who can actually play hyper carries uh that's gonna get taken away so I, I think that that's that's one way that we could probably look at it is if the other teams know that husha and if the other teams think that husha and doggo are the two most important players on the team then they're going to attack specific team compositions that are going to allow doggo to hide until the the mid and late game so i would expect Aphelios to be banned all the time Unless they think that they can ban away Thresh, and then Beyond Game Gaming wouldn't pick Aphelios, but that's probably wrong. Uh, that would be a good stat to. S that would be like a, a different kind of stat to look up. How often does uh, Beyond Gaming play Aphelios when Thresh is banned? Uh, it obviously happens because they have four wins with Thresh and nine with Aphelios. So uh, Beyond Gaming is another D team. I think that. Beyond Gaming probably can do okay. I think that there's no reason to think that they couldn't play as well as PSG at Worlds. Uh, now, people who watch the PCS all the time, maybe they can explain why there's some kind of huge uh, difference between the two teams. Um, I, I wouldn't be shocked if like PSG... I wouldn't be shocked if PSG is much better, and I wouldn't be shocked if they're equals. Uh, the fact that PSG played really well at Worlds, is so it's the same thing as Unicorns of Love, where... We see them for the second time. People expect them to play well. Uh, you know, is that likely to happen? Because people will think like, oh, th they should be able to take the next step this year. They had all this experience from last time. They had a lot of good performances on stage. Uh, and then people just want to let them take the next step. But taking the next step is kind of just more like narrative driven. It's not, it's not founded in reality the foundation is not in reality uh because a lot of the other teams are that are here were also at worlds last year 
Uh, so if both teams get a little bit more experience and you just have to default back to the other things that you use to evaluate different teams. Detonation Focus Me. Alright. Detonation Focus Me is another team in the last tier. Uh, they are... They are an interesting team. I definitely know Steel, Arya, and Utapon. I'm not sure about Eevee or Gang. So banned against LeBlanc, Aurelia, Akali. So from what I remember, Arya is supposedly like an insanely gifted uh, mechanical player and is the focal point of their team, which would make me think that they're going to play a lot of utility 80 carries in the bot lane uh, at Worlds because they don't necessarily need bot lane to carry. They want to put Arya into a spot where they can carry the game. The fact that this guy plays four games of Shaco, uh, that's completely insane. I would love to see that happen at Worlds just to be different. Uh, it looks like their top laner is somebody that they generally generally try to hide because they played Nar, Renekton, Set, Tom Kench. That is more that's that's not really a good sign. Uh it's just going to invite a lot of pressure from other top laners. So th so that's that's a prime example of like red canids, um unicorns of love. Those kinds of teams might just have a very easy draft against a team like Detonation Focus Me because they can depend on their top laner to be able to draft a champion that beats uh, Eevee's champion pool and then creates uh, a decent advantage in the laning phase, is the focal point that their team is trying to get ahead, maybe focus that tower first, make some plays around uh, Rift Herald to try to keep all the pressure on the top half of the map. That, that seems like it would be a pretty straightforward play style for a lot of these teams. Um, four Nidalee games, four Shaco games. That's pretty insane. Um, Steel and Arya have to be the heartbeat of this team because Utapon, if I if I remember correctly, and I'm not trying to be ageist, but I'm pretty sure Utapon is just like over the hill. Uh, that's just that's just the first thing that comes to my mind, and I can be completely wrong. But like I said, all I can do is take the information on the screen, think about it with what I have already in my head, and that's what I come away with. So, I think the last time that I saw... Was Dead Nation focused me at MSI? And they were talking about how Arya is, like, an insane player. And they had to move around, like, their roster in order to get Arya a spot on the, on the, in the lineup. Like, is, is, was Utapon their coach? Like, there was some, there was something like that going on. Where this wasn't their intended roster. I, th I think I remember that. I could be wrong. Again, if you know the situation better than I do, please tell me in the comments because I do want to learn that kind of information and it would make it much easier than me going to find it myself. Uh, I think I remember Arya playing a Seraphine game, Seraphine mid, and I just felt like it was a big waste because you're putting your supposedly best player that's going to carry your entire team on Seraphine. just doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Uh, Utapon, I would expect a lot of utility AD carries at Worlds uh, that try to get lane dominance, uh, or at least like can can go even in the lane without really trying. And then another support that plays a lot of engaged champions. You could probably use that that graphic for every single every single support that's here. Uh, most teams just play engaged supports because it brings engaged to the team, and it's a it's a necessary component for for good League of Legends. So. That's fine. Uh, detonation focus me. Th this is the first time where I, I see from like the champion pool and everything. I wouldn't trust their bot lane. I wouldn't trust their top laner. And their jungle pool is so like different that maybe they can steal some games that way. But I'd be I'd be afraid. Uh, it's going to really come down to steal and Arya. Are they able to create advantages? Um, I'm pretty sure that's their intention but we shall see next up peace so this is a team from australia that's interesting so oppie 
I don't know that player. Uh, but Camille, Jace, Leeson, Set, Viego, that seems like a carry player to me. Babip, uh, Nidalee. So another Nidalee player. Babip played well at Worlds last year, right? This kind of champion pool, the like these three cha these they're all very different champions. Like Zinjiao, Nidalee is just a like a, a traditional carry a, a traditional carry jungler, which is a good sign for the skill of a player like Babip because to to you to play it the right way is pretty difficult because of the cadence of a Nidalee game and it's more about kind of strangling out the other team instead of like snowballing out of control. It's a little bit more of like a controlled positional kind of match when there's a really strong Nidalee player. You see it a lot with players like Peanut where their games are either 30 to, 30 to 25 or 5 to, to 2. That just happens uh, at like an alarming rate. Um, so the fact that they play Viego top, mid, and jungle is pretty important takeaway. 74% kill participation. So Babip is the one controlling the tempo a lot of the time and brings the action with them. Tally, I think Tally was there last time um, for TF games. Personally, I think that when teams have TF as one of their main champions, it's generally a bad sign in my opinion, uh, unless you're like Dom1 Gaming, because it's so difficult to utilize TF the right way, and it kind of caps out your damage uh, from mid lane, which would be bad in the hyper carry tank meta. That I kind, I just, ge I genuinely think that's where we're going. Violet, six and two on Kaisa, six and one on Ezreal. That's pretty good. I've never heard of this player before, um, so just you know, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, Aladoric team had lots of roster swaps in summer. I don't know what to say about that. Uh, I don't expect much from this team at Worlds. Maybe they maybe they surprise some people, but I will not be betting on them. 59% uh, Renekton, Renekton ban rate. Viego gets banned out a lot, which is smart because it's a good flex pick. Not much to take away. Um, I forget what their team was named last time. Was it like Legacy or something like that? Don't remember. <laughs> Alright, next up. PSG Talon. So, we have Hanabi. Look at, the, look at that. Four champions with zero losses. Uh, so, Gwen, Renekton, Gangplank, Orn, and Gnar. The good thing about a champion pool like that is that it shows some flexibility in terms of the metas that they can play in. Like, if you leave open Gwen, we'll just play Gwen. If you if you give us Renekton, then maybe we just play Renekton in the top lane. If we want to play a hyperscaling game, we can throw Gangplank up there. If we want to play, uh, like, a Juggernaut composition or a Protect the AD Carry composition, we can try to play Ornn. Uh, if we want a blind pick that helps a little bit with Engage and doesn't cap out our damage profile as badly, or damage ceiling as badly throw in an R. That's just pretty interesting. Hanabi is the kind of player that every time I think about them, I have no idea how good I think they are. Like, was Hanabi in China at one point? Am I just, am I just making that up? River? River is definitely a good player. 7-3 and three on Lee Sin, 7-1 and one on Diana. They have the Diana-Yasuo com combination, which is very good. Uh, seven and zero on Xin Zhao. so teams are going to have a lot of difficult decisions to make against a team like PSG uh, in terms of what kind of uh, team compositions they want to take away from them. <laughs> we have another Aphelios player, uh, Maple. I, I don't think Maple is as good as they used to be, or I don't think that Maple is at. Uh, they're not as. Um, the talent differential between Maple and a lot of the other mid laners at Worlds is not going to be as noticeable as it was in the past. That's how I would want to say that. Um, a, a ton of experience. The kind of player that you can trust to to like 
put their team into good situations throughout the game, uh, they've kind of seen it all, which I don't think that it makes them more likely to win, but I think it does make it more likely that their games are close uh, against quality competition. Unified and Kaiwing. So I guess Unified is the one that didn't make it to Worlds last year for like uh, visa issues or COVID reasons, and Doggo had to come in. I'm pretty sure that's true. And I don't think Maple was there either. Uh, I think they had two or three players from a different organization. Um, but having a lot of Aphelios games is very important because it shows that the team is willing to play around them. Uh, you can't really say enough about something like that. There are a lot of teams at Worlds that, that are like that because domestically, they are probably more talented than the other teams in their region. So they can pull off stuff like playing Aphelios. But if if they don't realize that it's more difficult to play Aphelios when you're the not as good team, then it can kind of be a problem where they're just playing what they what they know, which is there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just it's it doesn't have the same oomph when the other team is more skilled. Uh, da -da -da. Five Trundle support games. That's very interesting. I would love to see Trundle Senna. At Worlds. That would be fun. For me. And for Bard Games. That's pretty cool. My nose is getting stuffy. I think guess my allergies are acting up. Uh, PSG. I have PSG in the tier above all of the teams that I've discussed so far. Um, so that's that. Next up, 100 Thieves. Uh, and 100 Thieves is a team that I think a lot of people just you know, have a different take on how good they are compared to myself. Um, band against, <laughs> honestly, I don't think that you can really put much weight into the band against because a lot of the teams in the LCS are just horrible. Uh, and they are trying to keep FBI from playing Callista when I don't know if that's really going to do much like most 100 Thieves is just strictly better than six or seven of the teams from the LCS. So they can kind of play whatever they want. So teams teams don't want to get blown out in the early game. Ban Callista. Someday has been around forever. Very versatile top laner. Uh, I don't... I don't... I don't know how good Someday is going to be on the international stage compared to a lot of these other top laners. I would assume that Someday is at least average for Worlds, uh, and I'd be willing to bet accordingly. Uh, Closer. Closer is a very interesting jungler. I love that the team plays around them a lot, but I think it's weird how they give priority to Closer's champion pool over Abadage's champion pool a lot of the time. I think that will probably change at Worlds. I think if we get into a late game, a late game meta, that could be a good thing for 100 Thieves. Like, Abadage, when they made the miracle run on Shalka, it was a lot of hyperscaling champions uh, in the mid lane that helped do that, including Cassidy. Um, and also, that would allow someday to play hyperscaling, a, a, either a hyperscaling champion or a tank that would do well against uh, assassins, if other teams are playing a lot of assassins. Um, Abadaga, I think he's a, I think he is a good mid laner. I think he's overrated at this point, but they function well within 100 thieves. So that is, that is a, a relatively important uh, note. And then FBI, I think FBI is a, a little overrated as well. But just the team, the team play does play really well with one another. I think that they, they understand the game uh, at a very high level for a North American team. And I think that's going to help them be consistent against bad teams and then have surprisingly good performances. Maybe not victories, but like su surprisingly good performances against a lot of the other regions. The one thing I'm concerned with about 100 Thieves for DraftKings specifically is that I don't think they're going to like completely go for it where they're playing um, like very volatile team compositions and willing to willing to take on action in the early game. I think they'll probably be a little bit slower at Worlds. 
just something to keep in mind. Uh, and then Huhi, a lot of engaged champions. Huhi has some has some very good games, which is fun to watch. Um, I I am somewhat uh, I am somewhat hopeful that 100 Thieves can put together a really good performance. Out of the te out of all the teams from North America, I, th I do think they are the most likely to perform well, um, because of of like their play style and how well they've done this split. Um, I do think C9 is more talented overall, but I, I, I'm fine with having 100 Thieves higher than them. I think it is more likely that they put together a good performance. All right, C9, one of my favorite teams to watch from North America. Very frustrating season, um, but that's the, that's the best time to stick with the team. Uh, so they, the most banned champions against Cloud9 are LeBlanc, Zinjiao, Gwen, Thresh, Callista, Aurelia. Fudge is a good top laner. Fudge has the upside of being a great top laner for North America. I don't know if that's going to translate that well into international competition, but it's definitely possible. I think that a lot of the games are ugly for C9, which is... It's one thing to lose a match. It's another one to, like, lose it in ugly fashion. And C9 just has a habit of losing very ugly, which makes... Which, which like, gives people... Um, it basically lets people count their losses twice. It's not only did they lose, which is the important part. They lost, and they died a lot when they were losing. It, it doesn't really matter. Like, if a loss is a loss... Like, losing a close game and losing and getting blown out... Ultimately, it's just one loss. Like, you could say that a lot of their losses are uh, caused by similar things, and that shows that they're not willing to learn and, like, change their play style. That might be fair. But I'm of the belief that talent is ultimately the most important thing. So, Fudge, I think, at their peak, is probably going to be... A slightly above average top laner at Worlds, but more likely to be an average top laner. And when I say average, I mean someone that's not going to create the winning difference in neutral situations for their team consistently. Like they can do it in a game, but can you do it in? Can you do it consistently in a best of five against a world class top laner? Much less likely. Blabber, Blabber has had a down year. Uh, a lot of uh, unluckiness uh, for Blabber, but I I still think that Blabber is, you know probably going to end up being the best North American jungler for the next couple of years. So, and I mean North American, not player in the LCS. Like, Blabber and Closer, I could see them being very competitive back and forth. I think Spika has a shot to be the best jungler uh, in the LCS as well. Um, but if I had to bet on it, I would say Blabber will be the best jungler in North America uh, overall for the next couple of years still. Uh, just a down year. And I think a lot of that uh, downward turn for Blabber has been caused by Perks. Perks has had a shocking season. I think that Perks is one of the most talented, if not the most talented, Western player of all time. The problem, and maybe this is a lie, but the whole eyeball thing seems to be a huge problem. Having Needing to wear the hat, there, there has to be some logical explanation for why Perks is playing this poorly. Uh, and they, they have had good performances at times, but just something is off with perks. So that's one of the reasons why I'm a little bit of afraid of C9 at Worlds. Just completely disappointing. Uh, is because if there is something wrong with perks, we will not know until it's too late. We will not know what the deal is with those eyeballs until after Worlds, probably. If anybody has some inside information on C9 perks and his eyeballs, let me know. Zven and Vulcan. So Zven... Zven's in a really tough spot. Uh, I don't like the way that C9 drafts for him in general. I think that he hasn't played well. I think that other teams kind of know that they should be attacking the bot lane. Uh, or creating advantages on the top side, rotating their bot lane up towards the top side, and then Zven's going to stick around in the bot lane. Uh, so that allows... It's, it's essentially a power play. You're allowing the other team to do whatever they want on the top half of the map. That's not good. That is not good. 
Uh, Vulcan. Vulcan's a really good support. Uh, it's unfortunate that, you know, Vulcan and Blabber haven't been able to shine this year because Perks has had a down year and Zven's just not who he used to be. Uh, I, I'm not saying that Zven can't turn back the clock and put together some good performances at Worlds, but it seems unlikely that they will win through the bot lane against good competition. I think that if we see strong performances from Zven, it'll be against the lower level teams, uh, which ultimately just, it's not as impressive. Uh, I think that C9 is most likely uh, in the tier second from the bottom, which is sad, and I'm hopeful that they can perform really well, but it seems like an uphill battle for C9 at Worlds. I was very hopeful when, when they had this roster originally. They do need a different AD carry if they want to be competitive, like as uh, like a an, an insanely good team next year. Uh, so. Next up, Infinity. Bugax, Solid Snake, Cody, White Lotus, Ackerman. So I definitely know Ackerman's name. I know he's a Thresh God. I don't know if a I don't know if a team from uh, Latin America or LLA I, that's Latin America right I don't think that a team from that region has ever played that well at Worlds I know that Jose Diodo basically got signed from because of their performance at Worlds so it's possible to look good but you know is are they going to consistently pick teams off of better teams I don't think so so I expect them to be in the bottom tier Nar zero and three on Camille that's a bad sign. Flex Lee Sin, Flex Akali, those are pretty good. <laughs> Solid Snake, Lee Sin, Volibear. If you play Volibear at Worlds, and it's and if you play Volibear at Worlds and your team is not a hyper carry team, then you're griefing. 3 0 Rumble. Don't really expect to see a lot of Rumble at Worlds. It'd be cool if we do. Actually, it would probably be annoying if we do. Rumble Rumble is kind of a killjoy champion. Uh, the game the games are just not as fun to watch when Rumble is equalizing. Uh, it's just, it's really oppressive. Um, Cody, we have Zoe LeBlanc. Zoe's a really tough champion to play when you're not as good as the enemy mid laner, but if you can pull it off, it can complete, it, like it's the kind of champion that can completely turn a game on its head because of the play style the enemy team is required to play. Nar, a lot of Nar bans, so I guess Bug Axe, likes using Nar as a safety blanket. Uh, LeBlanc. A lot of teams are banning LeBlanc. Um, that's interesting. Zoe. So Cody gets a lot of their bans. Lee Sin, Thresh. Which is not surprising because of Ackerman. And Trundle. Um, White Lotus. 5-0 oh on Kai'Sa. 0-3 on Ash. I could see I could see it happening. One thing that I don't like about teams that play a lot of Kaisa is that they generally don't get punished enough in lane uh, by the enemy team because the enemy teams just aren't as good as them uh, in their regions. But when you get two good teams playing against one another and one of them is playing Kaisa or blind picks Kaisa, just pick something that can beat it in lane, and then you have the easier path to a victory. I'm not saying that you have. I'm not saying that you're definitely going to win a game. But I'd rather play a lane punishing style against the Kaisa instead of uh, trying to scale. Like that's just the better way to go, and it gives you the tempo advantage. Uh, so that's always fun. Next up, Team Liquid. So Team Liquid, Team Liquid won me twenty thousand dollars last year at Worlds. Uh, so you gotta love that. Core JJ, literal world champion. Uh, 63% uh, ban on Thresh. Gangplank, Xin Zhao, Varus, Lulu, and Nautilus. So, Team Liquid would be a lot of fun in a hyper carry meta. I don't think that Tactical is one of the best AD carries at the World Championship, but Team Liquid does like playing the hyper carry style around Tactical. I know it hasn't happened as much this year, but I don't dislike that notion um i think that alfari being a carry player makes it less likely that they take that approach um although alfari could counter a lot of 
Like, if, if it's a hyper-carry team against a hyper-carry team, and the team is just lazily banning, or, uh, lazily blind-picking top laners, Alfari could punish that. Uh, Santorin... I'm not a huge fan of Sant... I, I like Santorin. But I am not a huge fan of Santorin's level of play at this point. Same thing with Jensen. Uh, Tactical and Core JJ are pretty interesting. Core JJ is still, still a very good support. Um, but I am concerned with the mid-jungle. I think a lot of games could get out of hand for them. So a team like... I would love to watch Team Liquid play against Detonation Focus Me. Because it, should, it could theoretically be... Uh, Steel and Arya, right? So Steel and Arya against Santor and Jensen. I think that Steel and Arya could pull off the upset in that spot just by playing through mid and jungle, try to get a good draft in and and see if you can win through mid lane. That would be pretty cool. And then the other thing would be you want to probably ban out some of Tactical's champions that could punish the laning phase, play super passive bot lane, force Team Liquid to make plays in the bot lane while you're trying to, to kill mid lane. Uh, or create an advantage in the mid lane. That seems like a pretty interesting matchup. Um, okay. So Team Liquid, I, I do have them in the second lowest tier. Uh, I'm not I'm not very hopeful for Team Liquid. But hey, if they want to win me 20 grand again, then uh, that'd be fine. Fnatic. So Fnatic and the European teams in general are teams that I have very different opinions on than people than a lot of the people watching this video. And you have to understand my you have to understand my position. I'm looking at this from a sports betting perspective. So when everyone, when almost everyone who watches these these videos are fans of the LEC and the LCS and they hear me talking badly about the LEC and the LCS, obviously there's going to be a lot of ne negative reactions, a lot of negative comments, a lot of disliking the video. But you need to understand that I'm not do I'm not saying this stuff because I want you to be upset. I'm saying this stuff because I think that your opinion of your teams that you like is too high. Um, not only is it too high, it's, it's high enough to influence the sports books because the sports books know that these are the most popular teams. So these are the teams that they have to prepare themselves to take a lot of money on at worlds. And that's just the, the game of betting. So I'm almost forced in the, into that position because it is generally a good idea to bet against the most popular teams when you get to a world championship because the sports books will want the less popular teams to win because the less popular teams will have less money bet on them meaning that if the less popular team wins then they get to keep all the money that was bet on the popular team it's very simple i'm not trying to be patronizing but i know a lot of the people who are probably watching this don't honestly just don't know that they just don't know about sports betting they don't know why the lines are set the way they are they don't know what those sport the lines even mean um and again i'm not trying to be mean about it it's just if you don't know then you don't know, which is fine. So you come at me, and you're all upset about me having LEC teams ranked low, which I can't do anything about that because I'm not going to change my mind to satisfy people. I, I would rather you scream at me in the comments and dislike my video than lie to you. I would I, that's I, I would really just prefer that. So let's do that. Um, so let's talk about the players. Adam has had a good performance throughout the split. I think the Darius performance from playoffs was super cool because that's one of the things that we knew about Adam from EU Masters was that he is a player who is willing to play off the wall champions in good matchups and then have the team play around them and can shoulder that load. That is an impressive thing. Uh, that is an impressive, I guess, kind of skill or characteristic of a player. Um, Renekton is one of their best champions. Uh, Darius is one of their best champions. Set is a good champion, not a great champion. Dr. Mundo, I don't want to see Adam on things like Dr. Mundo at all at Worlds. If, if like, Fnatic is the kind of team where they could easily take the bait of a late-game meta, where they're like, oh, 
we have Upset and Hillisong. Let's just put him on hyper carries. We'll have Adam play a tank in the top lane. Bwip will play like a tank or a tank buster in the jungle, something like Trundle. Uh, maybe play some Sejuani. Uh, and then we'll have Niski on like a supportive mid laner. And, you know, we'll play hyperscaling and it'll be all great. Is it possible for that to go well for them? Yes. Do I think it's likely? No. Why do I think it's unlikely? Because Fnatic, at their core, is a hyper volatile team. They specifically Bwipo, wants to create action. And I love Bwipo. Bwipo is such a fun player to root for. He's such an interesting player. He has great opinions on things. He's very cerebral. He's obviously very intelligent um, for a League of Legends player and probably just in general in real life uh, and is thoughtful. And being thoughtful a lot of the time gets you in a lot of trouble. Uh, but in a game like League of Legends, it it's like the willingness to fight from seemingly bad positions because you think that there's a way to claw your way back into the game. And I love that. That is like one of my favorite traits of four players um, in League of Legends. It's, it's, the, it's the biggest difference maker between players are the players who are willing to try to be the winning difference to get their team back in the game. And that's, that's really a great trait that Bwipo has. My problem is that just... From an archetype perspective, I just don't think that Fnatic is going to have an easy time at Worlds against the better teams. So Fnatic, for example, whenever they play somebody in, D in the D tier or in their own tier or one tier above them, which is most of the teams, they have a, a legitimate chance to win. So you could even have Fnatic winning, uh, having a positive record depending on what their group looks like uh, and making it to the, the knockout round. But all that's going to do is add more fuel to the fire that there's some kind of very good team and then you want to then i'm going to want to bet against them even more and it's very easy for me to create my narratives around why they would lose it's like yes adam is a good carry top laner but is he as good as some of the other top laners at this competition i would say no and then you have to ask yourself what if it's a carry versus carry top lane if it's carry versus carry then the highly variant style, that, that that highly variant matchup can create great performances for Adam, but can, it can also create some of the worst performances that we've seen out of Adam. And that's nothing, that's not to say anything negative about Adam. That's just the matchup kind of uh, necessitates that wide range of outcomes, uh, which is one of the reasons why it's fun to watch League of Legends, but it's frustrating sometimes when your team gets dominated. It just happens. Bwipo, I've already talked enough about Bwipo. Really good all-around player, huge playmaker. I love Bwipo. Niski, I hate Niski. I, I don't like his champion pool. I don't like how much he plays TF. I don't think that he's a very good player mechanically. I just, I think he's super overrated. When he was on Splice, he was not anywhere near as good as people gave him credit for. When he was on, uh, when he was in North America, he was nowhere near as good as people gave him credit for. He's very often carried by his jungler and that's not that doesn't mean that his team it's impossible for his team to win but he is not he is probably below average at worlds for mid laners he's probably below average and the problem is that mid lane has a most has a, a large portion of the most talented players in the world so it's extremely important to get good drafts in it's extremely important to not get banned out. It's extremely important to be able to respond to things in the map. Uh, it's just, it's a super difficult, it's a super difficult task for someone at the talent level of Niski. Uh, they can put it together in certain games. They've had some really great performances uh, and they can be a contributor to a winning formula, but they are not the they are not the kind of player who will carry a team to a world championship. And if and if they do that, then you can come back and yell at me all you want in the comment section. But that would be that would be the most unlikely way for Fnatic to win. I think it's much more likely that Fnatic goes into like supportive mid laners, like Galio, TF, where they're trying to play for the side lanes and things like that. That tells you all you need to know about the talent level of that player. Uh, in my opinion. And now people are going to say, oh, well, you know, Showmaker plays TF. Oh, well, B plays all kinds of champions that are supportive. Yes, and when those teams do it, I think it's a mistake. Uh, when Fnatic does it, I understand why they do it, because they think there's a talent diff uh, in a negative way. 
against a lot of these good teams, and they feel like they need to play that way. So if if that's their mentality, great. But that's not what the fans like to convince themselves of. Uh, and then in the bot lane, upset. I I really don't think upset's that good. I know that he's had a good. He's one of the better performers this split and this season in Europe. But there are so many AD carries that do the exact same thing that upset does. If you look at a lot of these teams that we've gone through so far, they are upset. They're the same exact guy. Their team plays around them, and they get a couple of items up on the other team, and then they can have a pentakill. That just happens. It's not. It's really not that impressive. It's For me, it's much more impressive when like, a jungler creates a play around Scuttle, when a jungler invades the other side and... Uh, creates an advantage for their team to take a Rift Herald or to, to take a Dragon. So much more of the winning happens because of everyone else than the AD carry. But when the team does what they need to do, it's up to the AD carry to kind of capitalize on that. And you need to be a good mechanical player. You need, you need to be able to position yourself well. It'll look very bad when you play bad. Uh, and you'll get flamed. But that just comes with the territory. That's what AD carries... That's who AD carries are. They, they just get all of the resources, they get all the glory, and they get all the blame. And I guess that's how it should be. Uh, but it doesn't mean that I have to think they're good, because I don't. Uh, Hillisong, I love Hillisong. Hillisong and Whippo are very similar in my mind. They're both very good playmaking players who are willing to try to create the winning difference for their team. Sometimes they fall flat, flat on their face, and that just happens. It just happens. Can't feel too bad about it. You just got to make the plays that you think will help your team win. That's literally, that's all you can do. It's all you can do. So, Fnatic. That's Fnatic. Next up, we have Rogue. No, we don't. We have Galatasaray. Crazy. So, Crazy seems familiar. Mojito does not seem familiar. Bolulu does not seem familiar. Alive and Zergsting. Don't really know much about these guys. Uh, so let's talk about the easy narrative that people are going to latch themselves onto. They're going to say, oh, well, you know, Turkish teams play well at Worlds. That If that's the main reason people are going to be playing uh, Galatasaray on DraftKings or, like, picking them to win... Uh, matches as underdogs or like picking them as slight favorites over other uh, like lower level teams, then you should be betting against them. I think that it's I think that is probably the right angle without knowing the matchups or anything like that. Just going into my analysis of those kind of matchups, I would assume that Galatasaray is overrated, and it's funny because it's just because of their region, but that does happen a lot. Uh, and then uh, yeah, that basically that's just the way that it is. Um, 6-0 on Viego, 5-0 on Rumble. It's funny that a lot of these teams are playing Rumble. Like, I wonder how far back these stats look, because that is strange to me. I would not expect that, uh, to be representative of the champions that we see at Worlds. Um, Bolulu... Alive, Zerg Sting. I, I don't know enough about Galatasaray to really speak to how good they are, and that's why I have them in the D tier. I know that some people will say, like, oh, well, you know, how can you justify putting them there? It's like, I just did. Like, that's that's all I can do. I, I can't say, like, oh, I don't know anything about Galatasaray, but I'm going to put him in the B tier because I want to. It just, you got to start from the bottom and work your way up. Because when I'm making picks, I'm just not going to pick Galatasaray. Uh,. Unless there's some kind of matchup thing that I find in my research for that match in particular. Next up, Mad Lions. Uh, so Armut, uh, who played in the Turkish League, uh, had a good performance at Worlds last year. People will want Armut to play well at Worlds. I want Armut to play well at Worlds. I don't have any issues with Mad Lions as an organization. I have a problem with people's perception of Mad Lions. People are way too high on Mad Lions in general. Um, and I know that I'll probably get flamed for that again. But when you are one of the more when you're the, the when you're the popular Western region, and you have all these people watching league and wanting you to win, uh, the amount of money that the sports books take on them is going to be too high. Just makes it a bad bet in my opinion. Uh, the thing is with, with when you're betting, 
you need to hit break even percentages to make the to justify the bet being a good bet for value uh and it's just not there for a lot of these teams like the number that was uh listed for mad lions to win worlds is like 1100 or 1300 that's insane there's no way they win that often uh if they win th this is really what you need to wrap your head around if they win you did not get as much value as you should have because the sports book knew how how popular of a pick it was going to be that's really how it is so like if you bet a hundred dollars and you should have won 150 dollars because of the risk that you were taking uh in reality you're gonna make like 120 and you might say to yourself well i want to just win money on mad lions because i like mad lions and i want them to win and i want to have money on them then fine but let's not let's not fool ourselves into thinking that they deserve to be at those odds to win the championship it's just not the case uh so el yoya el yoya one of the most overrated players in the world probably um that's just true in my mind uh shadow was scapegoated when in reality orome kind of destroyed mad lions chances at worlds last year uh humanoid is a an okay mid laner uh for the lec but like Niski, they are not good compared to a lot of the other mid laners that are at this tournament. And I would be betting against them for that reason. Like, oh, honest question. Honest question. Who do you like more? Who, going into this year, rank these three mid laners before this year started. Humanoid, Niski, Abadaga. Who do you, how would you rank those three players? Honestly. That's what you need to answer in the comments section below. Go ahead and you tell me what you think. Uh, I think people will know what my answers would be. Uh, but last year, I mean, even as as soon as or as recent as last split uh, in the spring, people were killing Humanoid because Humanoid wasn't playing well. So it's like it's just the way that it is. Karzi and Kaiser, I love Karzi and Kaiser. I think they're a, a really fun bot lane to watch. They are willing to take the game upon themselves and create advantages in the bot lane. Completely love them. They, they're a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and if Mad Lions wins and I have all these people yelling at me, I won't really care because Karzi and Kaiser will have won. And that would be really interesting. I, I think Karzi is a, a super likable player. Uh, and so is Kaiser. Kaiser talks a little bit too much on the analyst desk like and divulging like, the way that they look at stuff. If I was if I was his coach, I'd be like, "Hey man, like I I appreciate that you understand our game plan and that you can communicate it well, but let's not communicate it in front of everybody. Let's uh, let's just talk about that amongst ourselves." Um, but it is funny. Like a lot of his interviews just completely get derailed, and he gives a, he just gives away so much information. Um, but Mad Lions. So with Mad Lions, I think that Mad Lions is in the B tier, so I have them behind a lot of the Korean and Chinese teams, uh, just because I think it's it's much more likely that, relative to expectations, um, they're just a little bit lower in terms of value. Um, I wonder how they would do in a hyper carry meta. I, I, my gut says bad. I think that it'd be very bad for Mad Lions. And then last but not least, Rogue. So with Rogue, I, I'd still believe in Rogue. I, I genuinely think that Rogue it has more long-term talent than Mad Lions and Fnatic. And people might want to kill me for that. But Inspired, probably the best jungler in Europe. Larson is better than Humanoid and better than Niski. Han Sama is just as good if not better than Karzi and Upset and is more of a playmaker and has Draven who will probably be an important champion at Worlds uh and Hansama Hansama has played extremely well at Worlds uh for Misfits when when they made that run at Worlds with Power of Evil so there are a lot of good things that Rogue has done in the past that are just kind of being swept under the rug Oduamne has he had a pretty rough playoffs I don't expect it to stay that bad, but I also don't expect Auto Omne to be like a difference maker in the top lane. So it's really going to come down to like, can they put Auto Omne in, in matchups that go even and the rest of the team finds a way to win. And I think it's possible 
but it's going to be very difficult to do at Worlds against the elite competition. Like, w when people are looking at, like, teams and thinking about how they might do against, uh, like, what their record's going to look like at Worlds, I don't care if you go 5-1 and one or 4-2. and two. Uh, If you go 50-50 against the good teams or... 0% win rate against the good teams. That's the only thing that I care about. If you go around beating teams from lesser regions or teams from your own region or teams from North America, it doesn't do anything for me. You need to be able to compete with the teams from China and the teams from Korea if you want a realistic chance at, at winning worlds. And that's just the truth. Like, it's obvious, I think, to most people who are actually wagering a decent chunk of money that... Chinese teams are just better than European teams. Um, and again, I know that's not going to be a popular opinion because a lot of people watching this are huge fans of the LEC. And I'm not saying that you can't like your team. It's just don't think that your love of your team justifies unrealistic opinions about their chances to win. And then expecting people who are focused purely on like winning bets and getting value out of bets to also like your team. That's just not how it works. Like, we're here to make money. We're not here to say, like, oh, everybody deserves to have a chance at Worlds and garbage like that. Um, so with a team like Rogue, I think that Rogue can beat some of the teams at Worlds uh, from Europe and from... or from China and from Korea. But they're going to have a tough time against the elite competition. Like, I really don't see Rogue beating Damwon, EDG, FPX, or Genji. And I know, people hate that I like Genji, but I just don't see it. Like, if if it was Rogue against RNG, I still think it's very unlikely. Rogue against T1, maybe they have some chances. Rogue against Homolife and LNG, maybe they have some chances. Uh, but it's going to come down to, like, how do those teams adapt to whatever the world's meta ends up being. Um, that's, that's what's going to create... Uh, opportunities for Rogue to play well at Worlds, I think. Um, okay. So let's keep going. Dom won. So Dom won. The World Champs. They don't have Nuggery, now they have Khan. Uh, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Uh, Khan plays a lot of the champions you need to, and he has top lane diff against most top laners at this championship. Going into Worlds last year and the year before, people were saying he's the best top laner in the world. One or two years passes, now he's garbage to a lot of people. It's just crazy how much people's opinions change, in, in my opinion. Uh, Ziggs is banned a lot. Renekton's banned a lot. Lucian's banned a lot. Jace, Viego, Tom Kench. So... Khan can play carry top laners. He's an all-around top laner. He can play carries. He can play tanks. He can go 50-50. He can do it all. He's a great top laner. Canyon, probably the best jungler in the world, is able to play a hyper-aggressive style and create advantages in the jungle against basically anyone. That is why they are that. They are, that's why they are the best player in the best jungler in the world. Uh, with that being said, they're their champion pool is going to be somewhat narrow in terms of only playing carry champions. Like, if if we get to Worlds and it's a, a tank jungle kind of situation where all these teams are playing just boring jungle champions, uh, I would hope that Damwon does not just, like, fall in line and do the same thing. I hope that Damwon thinks of themselves as a team that can play whatever they want and force their playstyle on the enemy team. They do kind of turtle up a little bit and play less aggressive in a lot of matchups, which is not that fun for me. But they're just a very good, uh, a very good team, obviously. So, Showmaker, eight and one on the Blanc, seven and one on Rise. Showmaker can kind of do it all. He's not as flexible as Doonby, but he's just a great mid laner. There's no real argument for me there. My my concern with Dom Juan is their bot lane. I think Ghost and Barrel. Uh, I think Ghost is really the weak link. Um, at Worlds, they were able to play a lot of utility champions, and that masks a lot of the issues that AD carries have because you are not expected to you're not expected to do as much damage um, as the other 
carry champions or the other carry players on your team and like your contribution to the team fight being the additional utility is impactful but it's just not it, you're not the focal point of the team um just not a not a super mechanically gifted player i don't think uh especially relative to some of the other 80 carries that we have at worlds barrel is a good player not a great player i love a lot of the champions that they play like i love it when when Don Juan's playing like Senna Pantheon and stuff like that, that's a lot of fun to watch. And that is when they're at their best. And that's when they were at their best, in my opinion. Uh, so Beryl has that ability to be a super impactful player. Um, it's just been kind of a down, a little bit of a down year. Like they went through that weird streak where they were swapping around all their players. Uh, so there's that. Um, a lot of zigs. I don't think zigs is going to be that good at worlds i'd be i'd be actually i don't think that ziggs is going to be that good at worlds if anybody's going to pull off ziggs and make it look good it's going to be dom Juan gaming because that will allow them to play around the top half of the map let barrel kind of rotate up top and wreak havoc while ghost just farms in the bot lane and protects the tower that could work the problem is that not a lot of teams can pull that off the right way in my opinion Next up, Gen G. So the team that everyone hates me for, apparently. So Gen G, we have a top laner who plays a lot of flexible champions, Lee Sin, Nocturne, Viego, uh, and Renekton. Uh, has has put together some like kind of crazy performances over the past year against the other very good top laners from the LCK, which should go a long way in terms of people valuing Rascal High as a player. But for some reason, they just don't. And I think it's because everyone understands that Ruler is the most important player on the team. Clid. At one point, Clid was thought of as a very good jungler. People don't think of him as a very good jungler anymore. But he is a very good jungler still. Uh, it's less flashy than a lot of other players. Because he's not a traditional carry player. Like, he is more of the Volibear, Trundle... Diana is a carry champion, but he's more of, like, the Volibear. Like, that's his archetype. That's who he is at his core. Um, so if we get into a hyper a hyperscaling tank meta, a hyperscaling meta with a lot of tanks, I think that Clid would be in a really good spot. They already play the Trundle, so if the other teams are just, like, absent-mindedly picking Sejuani or Zac or just these kinds of champions that can get exploited by Trundle, then they'd be in a really good spot. BDD, very good mid laner. People are always talking about BDD as one of the best mid laners in Korea. But then, like when we start bringing European and Chinese mid laners into the fold, people want to like downgrade how good BDD is. I think that BDD is probably a top five mid laner at Worlds, which doesn't seem crazy to me. I, I don't know why that is a crazy take. Uh, plays a lot of controls, uh, a lot of control champions, but also plays the like. Uh, also plays set, which is like something that Korea uh, loves to do in general, uh, is bring the utility of set from team fights and just getting it on your team at all costs. And a lot of the time, that means really boring mid lane matchups. Uh, and then also has the Akali, which uh, I think she's got buffed recently, which is wild to me. That is, if we see a lot of Akali, like it'll be fun because there will be some flashy plays, but. When somebody makes a flashy play on Akali, you have to take it with a grain of salt because the champion is just wild. So, uh, I'm hopeful that BDD will have a good performance at Worlds. Then you have Life, who a lot of people just don't like from DraftKings because they have really low kill participation. Um, and then we have the star of the show, who is Ruler. Ruler is one of the two best AD carries at the World Championship. Ruler has carried a team to a World Championship before. Ruler is the best AD carry in Korea right now, and Ruler will be able to be impactful in every possible meta. If if it turns out this is a meta where you need to be good at playing utility AD carries, guess what? Ruler can do that. If you need to play lane dominant champions, Ruler can do that. That's why there's a 78% ban rate on Kalista. If you need Ruler to, to just completely turtle and come online for that one fight around Baron at 25 minutes or 30 minutes in a low in a low kill score game, Ruler can do it. Probably, probably the best 
mechanical AD carry in the world. Maybe it's Viper, but I think it's... I don't know. It's one of them. Those are the two options that you get. Uh, so I love Genji. I think that, I think that Genji is going to surprise a lot of people at Worlds. Um, every time that they play against a European team, I can't wait. It's going to be great. Going to be great. Next up, Hanwha Life. So Hanwha Life is another team that s just snuck into Worlds, basically. People are afraid... Not afraid. People are are people don't have really solid opinions on Hanwha Life because they don't know a lot about the players. So Morgan, Morgan's a super talented player, played in China, came over to Hanwha Life, wasn't playing uh, consistently for Hanwha Life, which was just a mistake. Uh, Dudu was, get, I think it was Dudu, right? Dudu was getting a lot of games, which it's, it's scary that the team could think Dudu is going to help the team win more than Morgan. Uh, but Morgan is a super talented player, is a, a a true carry top laner. I would love to see Hanwha Life play against Team Liquid, against Mad Lions, against Rogue, against Fnatic, uh, and just have Morgan get into a carry versus carry matchup and dominate. Like I don't, I'm not saying that he would dominate every single time that they play one of those top laners, but I just think that it would be great. Because people, I don't think people would really expect that from from Morgan. But uh, you put him in the right matchup, and he can completely take over a game. Uh, Willer, I don't know much about about Willer as a player. Seven and two on Viego, three and one on Lee Sin. You have the Trundle, so if we get into the tank meta, that's fine. Uh, the fact that he plays Viego for a Korean team uh, means that he's probably a, an extremely talented mechanical player. Is able to make gigantic plays. And that's what you need from your jungler nowadays. Uh, Chovy, one of the best mid laners in the world. Not much to say there. Deft, been very underwhelming this split. Uh, the team has truly been carried by Chovy. Uh, my, one of my big issues with Hama Life is that I think that they're probably going to be slow at Worlds against the other elite teams. And that's where we're going to get into trouble with a team like Hama Life. If we see Hama Life blowing out shitty teams and then they come up against a good team there's going to be a lot of people out there saying oh you know Hanwha Life they've been so much different this time at Worlds they're playing hyper aggressive look at how bloody they are then they go up against a team like Dom Juan or FPX and they go back into their shell they let the other team make all the plays and then they have to get like reactively lucky or outscale it is concerning um I wouldn't be afraid of Deft at this point uh if this is a hyperscaling meta Deft would be better off in a utility AD carry meta uh, similar to the one that we had at last year's Worlds. Uh, so if that's the direction we go, then that would be nice. And then Vista, I don't have much to say about Vista. T1, one of my favorite teams. Uh, so I don't know if this is the roster they're going to use at, at Worlds, but Kana is one of the best top laners at Worlds, a top five top laner at Worlds. Kana is another player where people aren't going to realize the talent differential in the top lane until we see them against the top laners from the LEC, the top laners from the LCS. Uh, Warner is another new jungler that I don't have a lot of uh, like footage that I've seen of them. Uh, T1 has played like three or four different junglers this year. Uh, Faker, one of the best players of all time. Um, there's not, there's not much to say really. Uh, Faker is good in every meta. Not great in every meta, but is good in every meta. And if we get into some kind of like weird assassin meta, then Faker is probably going to shock a lot of people with how good they still are. Um, if we get into a hyperscaling meta, we might see some annoying stuff like Lulu mid, but. That's fine. Uh, and then the bot lane, we have Karia, who I think is the best support player in the world. Uh, it's very frustrating from a DraftKings perspective, but Karia is going to be the best support in the world for multiple years, probably, I think. Um, and then Gumi Yusi and Teddy are going back and forth. I don't know who's going to play. Uh, it might come down to the meta that we get. I don't know what, I don't know what to do about that. Uh, but I think, I do believe that T1 will make the right decision according to champion pool and according to matchups. And that's why you have to have T1 
in like the the second highest tier because like you have the uncertainty around them that they, they might not necessarily be able to compete with Damwon, Genji, EDG, FPX, but they still have that extreme upside if the meta shakes out the right way and if they have a good read on it. Um, all right, four more teams. EDG. So EDG is going to be in a very good spot if it's a hyper carry meta. That's really how I differentiate between these these uh, final the like the final upper tier teams. Like if it is a mid lane centric meta where junglers are allowed to like hyper carry uh, and really dominate the game, then I think that um, Dom One and FPX are going to be better. But if it's like play around your AD carry, then I think that EDG and Gen.G will be better. Uh, so that's that's one way to try to find a good bet uh, for who will win Worlds. Uh, that's why I like Gen.G so much. Flandre, Flandre's a good player, not a great player. Uh, he was a great player at one point, but at this point in their career, they're probably just outside a top five top laner at Worlds, definitely a top 10 mid laner. Uh, Definitely a top 10 top laner at Worlds. Jai Jai. Jai Jai and Junjia, uh, it's still a question mark for me. Like, I think that Jai Jai is always at risk to get subbed out. <laughs> Excuse me. We saw that uh, during playoffs. Uh, but Jai Jai is good enough. Uh, Jai Jai is good enough to win a championship, I think. Scout. Scout is a very good mid laner. Uh... On a similar level, on a similar level to Faker, at this point they're both probably past their prime, but they're both still very good. Uh, so I'm not concerned with Scout. Viper, one of the best AD carries in the world, I think a top two AD carry in the world. Mako has been around forever, very good support player. There's not much more to say. Like these guys can do everything. That's that's why they are, uh, you know, one of the best teams in China is because they can kind of do a little bit of everything. Like if if the jungle meta shakes out the wrong way that would be a big problem for edg but if it's like a tank meta then it's it's more difficult to have like a huge talent uh a, a huge skill expression difference in the jungle so i'm not super afraid of that fpx fpx extremely good nuggery one of the best top laners in the world his cannon is out of control Everybody's probably going to have to ban Kennen against them at Worlds unless Kennen gets nerfed or if there are counter picks that end up proving to be very good against it. Um, they generally will save counter pick for him, which is shown in the notable column. Uh, they play Jace, Kennen, Gwen, Nar, and Renekton. They play everything. There's there's nothing that Nuggery can't do in the top lane. Super high expectations for Nuggery at Worlds, which they probably won't be able to meet, but they'll still probably be one of the top performers in the top lane regardless. Tion, not a huge fan of Tion at this point in his career, but 12 and 1 on Viego is pretty good. That's going to force teams to do something about Viego in the pick ban phase and it just eats up draft space, which is fine because Tion can play a ton of different champions. Uh haven't seen them on Lee Sin a lot because it gets banned out a decent amount, but I think that a lot of teams at Worlds are going to leave open Lee Sin for, in, in hopes that they can get it, but then Tion would be able to take it. So it's kind of a catch-22. And you can't ban out all of his champions. Like, you can't... you can't On a team that has Nuggery, Tion, and Duenby, you can't ban Viego, Lee Sin, Kennen, Gwen. You just can't ban everybody. So one of these players is going to get a champion that they're just insane on. Duenby, probably the most fun player in the world to watch. Nothing more fun than watching B and his antics on stage. Uh, one of the smartest League of Legends players in terms of instincts. Well, I guess those are maybe different. Uh, but a blend of both. In the best instincts in the world, probably. Great shot caller. Gotta love B. Plays a little bit of everything. It, it is a little bit concerning when they draft compositions that are built around LWX, which... If it's a hyperscaling meta and LWX convinces themselves that they're uh, like one of the best AD carries in the world, I think that could be a pretty big problem for FPX if they draft that way. Uh, Ten and three on Aphelios. A lot of those wins are probably just coming coming against lesser competition. Um, 
a lot of Varus games. Varus is going to get nerfed again, so I don't think that really matters. Like, the, the combination of champions that you get on this kind of team are very important because if you... If you draft like a utility AD carry for LWX and it's a hyper carry meta, sometimes FPX will do things like draft a supportive mid laner when their team just doesn't have enough consistent damage and then they kind of fall flat on their faces. It has happened before and I'm sure it'll happen again. Um, just hopefully not at Worlds. And then Crisp is an all around good player. Tian, doing B, LWX, Crisp. Guess what? They've all won a World Championship. That's pretty scary. LNG. Uh, I think LNG is in the second tier of teams, but I'm hopeful that they'll be able to play well uh, at the World Championship. Ale, Ale is going to surprise a lot of people. I think that he is an extremely gifted top laner, gets a lot of Camille banned against them, uh, plays a lot of Viego. So again, you need to probably ban Viego. You probably are going to want to ban some of these assassins if it becomes an assassin meta. You'll want to get rid of Camille um, so that you can pick a tank. Uh, you'll want to get rid of a myriad of Tarzan's champions, because Tarzan might be the best jungler in the world. Uh, Lee Sin, Xin Zhao, Vala Bear, Diana, showed Zack off in the playoffs. Uh, there, is no, there is no jungle champion that will come into the meta that I will think invalidates Tarzan, or makes him uh, not as good. Uh, any jungle meta, and Tarzan's going to do well. Icon. Icon's had a surprisingly good year. Uh, they have kind of been unleashed after leaving their previous team. Uh, playing next to Tarzan will do that to you. So I, I don't want to overrate Icon at this point. I think that might be kind of happening right now where people say, oh, look at how good their stats are. Look at the carry performances that they've had. Uh, when in reality, a lot of that should be contributed to Tarzan. It's just that Icon's the one who kind of cashes in on it. And then Light and... Is it L Wandy or I Wandy? I thought it was lowercase L Wandy. Uh, whatever. Um, they're a good bot lane. I think that they'll do fine against most teams at Worlds. They have a lot of, uh, they have a lot of different play styles that they can, they can utilize. And again, I, I would not be surprised if LNG dominates bad teams and plays slow against good teams and tries to win like a positional game of League of Legends against, uh, other strong teams. It's probably the right play style. It's just frustrating when you have DraftKings lineups and stuff like that. And then we have our last team, RNG. I think RNG is overrated. I think that Xiaohu is a top three top laner, probably. Wei, good jungler, not a great jungler. Cryon is probably underrated somehow at this point because uh, they had a pretty bad year and people want to contribute a lot of RNG struggles to Cryon. But... I don't know if that's really the case. Uh, can play the supportive playstyle. If it goes to a hyper carry meta, it'd be interesting to see what Crying would be able to do if they had a better AD carry. I'm not a believer in Gala. I know that Gala had a good MSI and had has had a lot of good performances. I kind of think they're a Kaisa one trick. And if Kaisa gets buffed like she might get buffed, then maybe RNG has uh, the secret sauce and just can, can, can play Kaisa every single match. Uh, but I think teams would... Uh, quickly start banning out Kaisa against RNG. And then Ming's a good player overall. So RNG, do they have a chance to win the championship? Of course they do. In terms of value, they're already so hyped. Like FPX, EDG, Damwon Gaming, you're not going to get a good number on those teams because the sportsbook is terrified of them. They know that they're the most likely teams to win because they're super good. So if you want to win a bet, then yeah, you can put in a bet on, on one of those teams or all three of those teams. But if you're looking for value and trying to maximize the amount of money you can uh, get uh, in return for the bets that you're making, you're probably going to want to go somewhere else for your futures bets. Uh, so I think one thing that you'll, you'll probably take away from this is that most teams play a lot of the same champions. So what does that mean? That means that the, that means that the, the better teams... The, it means that the, the lesser teams are going to have to decide, is it worth giving away a champion that we play to the other team for the chance to take it and play it? And that's a very difficult decision to make because you really can't ban these good teams out. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that could happen in these drafts, and 
it really depends on the matchups to see exactly you know how they might want to approach a draft. So it's not really worth getting into the, into too much detail on that now. Um, but I just basically wanted to make this video because I thought these inf infographics were awesome, and I wanted to increase the awareness for Molecule because this kind of stuff takes a lot of time and effort. Good job, Molecule. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you later.